In today's episode of Weld.com, we're going to do some cast iron repair. Now in the past, you've probably seen it done with silicon bronze. Well, I have a completely different method of how to do it. Let's go ahead and check it out. So today we have a cast iron griddle that the cameraman brought in for us because we just can't seem to find any cast iron around here. So we went ahead and broke the handle off to the uh, dramatic separation of the, uh, the handle and the pan. Well, that was easy. All right, so the first thing we want to do, as with anything else that we're working on, this can't be too clean. So I'm going to go ahead and clean it up. I have some cooking oils and stuff on the surface here that I want to get rid of. Uh, my go-to for cleaning a lot of the stuff is dechlorinated brake clean. Now you want to make sure you get the green can and it should specify non-chlorinated versus the red can, which is chlorinated. Once you use a chlorinated product on, uh, on anything and you expose it to a high, high temp and high UV, you create phosgene gas. You don't want to be huffing that stuff in. It could potentially kill you. So make sure you have the right stuff. I wouldn't recommend using acetone on this because it just doesn't do as good of a job. If this is some cleaner material, brand new, you can wipe some acetone on there, you know, get rid of some surface contaminants. But um, for anything dirty or it's been in service for a while, highly recommend non-chlorinated brake clean. Let's go ahead, I'm just gonna spray everything off, wipe it down, and then once we're done with that, we'll clean it up with some hot soapy water just to get any residual brake clean off and uh, should be good to go. So the first thing we wanna do, you wanna safety up, right? You don't wanna be uh, getting this stuff on your skin, so get you some latex gloves or something of that nature. Uh, we'll get it cleaning. I prefer to use a brake clean over an acetone just for the simple fact that uh, acetone tends to smear grease around. So if this was a new item, polished, cleaned aluminum or anything like that, uh, acetone would work just fine. But because this has heavy contaminants on it, I'm gonna go ahead and use the brake clean. It just does a much better job. All right, so I've got lint all over this now. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit that up with the air hose. But uh, for the most part, <clears throat> all the oil's gone, especially I'm really concerned about the area where I'm gonna be welding this on. So I wanted to get rid of all that stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit this with an air hose, blow the lint off, and then uh, we'll go ahead and tack it up and I'll show you guys how to do this. Okay, so I went ahead, everything's cleaned up now. So what I'd like to do is I'm gonna do a test fit with this piece. I wanna to try to get it back to its original state uh, before I put a couple tack welds on it. Now, because it's cast, you should be preheating this stuff before you weld on it. However, these are gonna be sacrificial tacks. What I mean by that is I'm just gonna tack it up to where it'll hold just enough for me to go ahead and dremel out some grooves in here to where I can get a proper weld on there. Once I do that, once everything's uh, dremeled out where I need it, I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna, we're gonna get some preheat on it before we actually go to do the welding. Now, as I said before, the way that I do this is a little bit unconventional compared to other videos you may have seen on cast iron repair. What I'm actually gonna do is I have some nickel 99 stick electrode here. I'm gonna bust the flux off and then I'm gonna clean that up with some sandpaper and I'm actually gonna use this for TIG welding. Um, the reason I chose to do it this way, I've done this repair on several pieces of cast iron in the past and they're still in service today. So I know that it works, it works really well. And for those of you that are at home, this is something uh, pretty readily available at your local weld supply store. You can pop in there. They usually have these hanging on the shelf. I think the, about $14 a pound, but I had a student give me this, uh, I think back in 2015, and uh, I've still been using them for projects like this. And it just seems to work out really well. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna piece this in here, and we'll get a tack on it and clean this up, get everything uh, dremeled out, and get some preheat on it. Let's do it. Today I'm gonna to use the Everlast Lightning MTS 275 to do all this. Like I said, I'm running about 80 amps in here. Probably not gonna use all of it. Running on DC negative, very similar to welding steel or stainless. All right, so because the uh, the background or this crack is gonna be hard to see, I'm gonna go ahead and outline that with a marker for you guys so you'll be able to see it at home. Uh, and then we're gonna go ahead and dremel this crack out. What I wanna do is put a nice groove on both sides. Uh, one thing I wanna recommend anytime you're dealing with um, with metal shavings, you know, if you have to do any deburring or uh, work with a deburring tool. I like to wear nitro gloves or latex gloves because if I use my regular uh, cotton gloves or synthetic gloves, they just get loaded up with filings. Uh, so if I use the nitro gloves, the slivers, uh, splinters, whatever you want to call them, they don't penetrate the glove. And once I'm done, I can throw it away. So I don't have to carry around with a pair of gloves that are loaded up with metal filings. Let's go ahead and get into it.
and done. All right, so we got everything cleaned out. We got the drum one there. Got a, got a nice little groove going on in there. That's gonna do a couple of things. One, it's gonna allow me to get good penetration in there. It's also gonna give me a good visual representation when I start TIG welding that. If I would've just left that crack in there, chances are I really wouldn't be able to see where I'm going underneath the hood. So we got that set up. I'm gonna go ahead and put it in this very highly sophisticated uh, warming apparatus to, uh, to get this up to 350 degrees, and I'm gonna check that with a temp stick. One thing you can do at home, you can use oxyacetylene torch, you can use a map gas. I mean, if you don't have propane, you can use charcoal. I prefer to use propane and propane accessories. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and give it about uh, 10, 15 minutes. I wanna make sure this thing gets up to about 350. I said, what do you want from Amanda? And Amanda bent down and said, I need about 350. Hey, that block down monitor said he wanted about 350. I just gave him 350 last week. Well, no wonder he keep coming back. Woman, well, you give him 350 last week, he's gonna want 350 more. All right, we've had it in there for about 10 minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and check, make sure it's uh, hitting 350. Right about 350. Then I'm gonna set it over there on the table and I'm gonna go right to welding as soon as, uh, as, soon as I get it over there. So it's a Temple stick from Temple. You can get these on uh, Amazon. You can get them from your local weld supplier. All you have to do is touch it in the material. If it melts, it's hit 350 at least or, um, or it's exceeded that temperature. There we go, tree fitting. All right, I've got the welds completed. I'm gonna go ahead, take this, put it back in the, in the, uh, the grill. I wanna do a post weld heat treatment with it. I wanna let it cool down naturally. So what I'm gonna do is turn the burners down from high to low. I'm gonna let it sit there for a while and then I'll just shut the burners off. Now, if you have a regular charcoal grill or you're using um, oxy fuel or whatever, just kind of taper that heat off. You can also pack it in a, a box full of sand. Probably extreme overkill for, you know, a cast iron cooking pot. But like I said, if you have other castings that are a little bit more delicate, that's the process you're going to want to go with. All right, she's still a little warm, but should be good to go. So that's pretty much the, uh, the process on how you want to do it. So again, clean it. It can't be too clean. Go ahead, grind the groove or put some pre-tacks on there. Grind everything out, get you a nice little groove in there so you can follow it when you're welding and then that way you're getting good penetration. Do a little bit of preheat. Like I said, it's probably overkill for a cast iron pot, but if you have any other types of castings that are more critical, definitely recommend the preheat and then uh, weld it out. Follow that up with the post heat and then you should be good to go with that. Um, like I said, there's, there's plenty of other ways to do your post heating. You can uh, 
If you're just using charcoal briquettes, you can leave it in there overnight, just leave the lid on there and let it completely burn down. What you want to do is you want it to cool uniformly and slowly. So you don't want to quench it, you don't want to hit it with air, you want to let it cool down slowly. So that pretty much concludes it guys. Hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something from it. Um, I know there's a bunch of different ways to do cast iron, so if you have a different process, go ahead and drop it down there in the comments. Uh, again, we appreciate you watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, make every well better than your last. Hear the boy that's been whacking off in my tool shed? Who damn dime lock that's wonder what a tree fitty? Excuse you guys, I'm going home.